Welcome back to Unleashed at Work and Home, the podcast dedicated to helping pet professionals feel less stress and find more joy in their daily lives. My guest today is Jamie Holmes, a registered veterinary technician, and the topic we're going to cover is organization, but I can tell we're going to be a little disorganized on this podcast because I have all sorts of questions to ask Jamie that aren't all related to organization. Welcome, Jamie. Thanks for coming on. Pauline, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here, and I love talking about organization and joy in our daily lives outside and inside of veterinary medicine, so thanks. Your background is interesting, complicated, and layered. Can you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure, and that's without even going into my background. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Currently, I'm the administrative manager for DrAndyRourke.com and Uncharted Veterinary Conferences. I work as an admin manager for the Recover Initiative for the VEX, uh, the Veterinary Emergency and Critical Care Society Facility Certification Committee. And I also am an administrative manager for uh, Ken Yagi and Dr. Sai Clement. And I speak uh, nationally on mental health, suicide prevention, and behavioral interviewing and a few other random topics. That sounds like so much. I'm not sure where sleep fits in. Um, I have a sleep disorder, so (laughs) it doesn't always fit in well, um, but, um, you know, it's, I keep busy, um, and probably my version of work-life balance is pretty different than other people's, and it's, um, like a lot of other things, a coping mechanism, um, so that I don't have to do tons and tons of thinking. I can just (laughs) do my job and, uh, and stay busy. Yeah, that's a really important point you just said there. Um, first, well, two. First, that the patterns that work for you aren't necessarily those that work for others. We all have to find our own strategies, sure. and that lots of things become coping mechanisms. Um, that Absolutely. some of this is a coping mechanism, and we all have stress, and we all have coping mechanisms for dealing with our stress. The word we've chosen for today's episode is organization, and I based that on an article that I read of yours where you mentioned that organization was a skill you developed in your past. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I had a fairly uh, difficult childhood, um, and uh, like most people who have trauma, um, I developed coping mechanisms. And at some point in your life, you get to a point where you say, this coping mechanism doesn't serve me anymore. This behavior isn't helpful. And I discovered that a bunch of my coping mechanisms were really helpful. So my need to put things into order and have things organized and my environment organized and and clean and um, things laid out for the next day and my to-do list and all of those things, they really served me in a way that... um, that I could use, that I could monetize actually, because I had this skill set that other people um, didn't have. And a lot of people don't, don't need to value that in, in their life. Like that's not, that's not the, the strong um, driver. And for mm-hmm. me, because it was a coping mechanism, it was a really strong driver. And the same thing with um, staying busy and having probably a little bit more work than, than play. Uh, but that's a good harmony for me. If I had as much off time as I had work time, I would be very uncomfortable and it would not be, uh, I would not be as productive at work. The science actually shows that it's harder for us to be happy in unscheduled time than it is mm-hmm. for us to be happy in scheduled time, which can be tricky. To, to realize that, you know, we spend all our time going, oh, when I go on vacation, when I go on vacation, when I go on vacation, then we get to vacation and it's sort of like, well, what am I going to do today? Oh, yeah. I don't know. And the thoughts creep up and the, you know, all sorts of other things pop up and we find ourselves not as happy in our off time as we hoped. And there is some benefit to having some structure so that when we're looking at even your playtime, having a plan for what that might be, that that's organization again, like the layer of having a framework can help us actually find the joy there. Absolutely. And I, I agree. I think it's really important and it can also 
um, mean success to your playtime. So it depends upon what your hobbies are. One of mine is gardening. And uh, you just, I mean, you can haphazardly garden, but you can also, if you're trying to do vegetables or fruit, you need to pay attention to planting times and harvesting times and when it's time to trim your trees and all of those sorts of things. And if you don't have a plan, if you're not paying attention, that stuff will slip past you and then you don't have as successful of a harvest and then your hobby isn't as fun. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. So when you had mentioned before about about organization being a coping skill, I think that it is true for, for a lot of pet professionals that there is some trauma in their backgrounds, that many of many pet professionals I have encountered have had difficult experiences. And I think part of being human is having difficult experiences. And then of course, there's the level beyond that would be trauma. So like we all struggle, but then some of us have had other things that are, that are more. Um, the coping skill of organization is, I think, not an uncommon one to develop in that kind of background, but I think a similar thing that could have happened, or the, the opposite that could have happened, is just a complete randomness. So I think when we're looking at pet professionals, one really valuable question for people to ask is, what are the, what are the skills I gained? from my previous experiences? What have I learned from that? And how does it serve me now? Sure. And I think that one of the things that you'll see with most pet professionals is an overdevelopment of empathy mm -hmm. and, uh, and the ability to put yourself in, in another person's shoes. And I think we start off um, in, in the profession with so much empathy for the clients and so much empathy for the pets. And that that's a really big key to telling us, hey, maybe we're not okay, is that we start to edge towards not having so much empathy um, for the pet owner, um, mm -hmm. the client. And I see that, uh, I saw that in myself where I'd be frustrated with a client. And I've been out of practice for about six years now um, doing administrative work. And I've been, that means I've been a client for six years and my empathy has, has shifted again and come back around to where I'm like, oh man, things really do happen overnight. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you're busy, you're, you're working, you're doing whatever it is that you're, you're doing on your off time. And then all of a sudden this animal that you spend every night with that sleeps in your bed, all of a sudden you're like, oh wow, she has this sore on her, on her mouth. And to me, it just happened overnight, but it probably wasn't overnight. It probably happened over months, but she's been eating, she's been drinking like yeah. none of the signs. And I think that we lose that empathy along the way as we become more and more uh, stressed and we don't spend our off time unplugged and, um, and recharging. Yeah, and that's really important because empathy is such an incredible gift to veterinary professionals and other pet professionals, and it's also the thing that hurts us. It's also the part. It's that your greatest strength is your greatest weakness issue. Yeah. So from, I really agree with that. Yeah, it's it's tough. I think I I for years felt like I needed to toughen up, like like I was feeling too much and caring too much, and um. Now my perspective has shifted in that I should show up and care just absolutely as much as I do, but that I need to find a way to process and move through some of that. And that, that was the piece that was missing for me was how to be there in the moment with someone, but not carry that moment with me when, when it had ended. Um, but it wasn't toughening up and, you know, developing a shell, which it, for years, I thought maybe would be helpful. Like if only I could just put my armor on and go to work and not have my heart hurt, that'd be great. <laughs> but no, um, that doesn't that doesn't serve any of us when we no. have less empathy. Yeah, that was actually one of the coping mechanisms in my childhood that I um, I let go of, and that was the walling off um, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and the not needing anybody else and not letting anybody else in. Yeah. Um, all of those things I had to let go of. 
and it took a really long time. Um, and it took a really long time because I believed that that served me. And so once I recognized that that behavior didn't serve me in a team, um, if I wasn't letting other people help me on the team, I wasn't doing the right thing for the animal. Um, and I certainly wasn't doing the right thing for the team. And that made a really big difference for me and actually spurred me to go into therapy and to go get help and to talk to somebody and work through my issues and learn coping mechanisms, um, healthy coping, coping mm -hmm. skills, um, and choose through what the coping mechanisms that I had were uh, for the ones that were going to continue to serve me well in my life. And I got to do lots of really interesting um, classes. I was a Kaiser member. And so with Kaiser, a lot of their uh, therapy is through group classes, um, not the standard group therapy that you might think of, but kind of like being in a class where you, where you learn about something. So I did cognitive behavior therapy. I did dialectical behavior therapy. I did um, action commitment therapy. Uh, and they were all fantastic. I would do them all again, because every time you take a class like that, it's you learn a new skill and you only learn them by, um, by using them. Yes. Um, and it takes practice. Right. And that's actually a big piece of what we do in the Unleashed Resilience community is we take a skill and we practice together. It's the practice, I think, um, and the shared experience is, is very mm -hmm. helpful too, but having a safe place to practice and go, I'm not good at this yet. Let's, let's try it um, where it's not real life, where we're not diving in and having the high stakes. I'm really curious, what sparked the insight for you that these coping mechanisms, the walling off and things that you had thought were serving you well, what, what helped you see that they really weren't serving you? Um, reviews at work. So I was a fabulous technician. Like I was getting highest marks in, in my technical work. Um, but my people skills continually on my reviews was I was getting negative marks. Um, mm -hmm demerit points, whatever, however you want to put it. <laughs> um, and I'm the sort of person that when you give me that sort of feedback, it's uncomfortable and it hurts, but I want it again, coping mechanism. I want to know how I can be better for you. And so it started off as a quest to, uh, overcome this negative review and make my supervisor happy with me. Mm -hmm. Um, and it became a, a, wow, I can be, I can genuinely be a better person. Um, and one of my really good friends and somebody that I work with on the Recover um, Initiative and with Vex is Ken Yagi. And he was one of my managers. He was not the manager who was writing my reviews, but he was one of my managers. And one day we're standing in the ICU and he looks across the room at me and I don't remember what had happened, but he said, Jamie, what do you think is more important? Um, being kind, and this is paraphrasing, being kind or getting the job done. And I said, getting the job done, of course. <laughs> and he nodded. And um, he is one of the most gentlest people you'll ever meet. And so when he looked at me and he said, what if you could be both? It was like my dad talking to me. And I was like, oh. And that, so that was a huge thing yeah. for me that like, this defense mechanism of being gruff, being assertive, um, and not, not the like everybody wins assertive, but aggressive assertive mm -hmm. wasn't, wasn't serving me in this situation. And that I had the capacity to do both. I could be both kind and get the job done. Um, and that was literally a revelation to me. Um, I, it had never occurred to me that you could do that you could do both things and that I could value both things just as much. What a gift and how wonderful that you were open to learn and grow from that. I, it was the right time in my life, probably 10 years before that or five years before that, I wouldn't have been able to hear that message the same. And I wouldn't have understood what he was, what he was saying. Mm -hmm. um, but he was, he was absolutely right. I not, not only is it something that other people could do, um, but I could also do that. 
and I could look at other people that I worked with who were both kind and very competent. Mm-hmm. And I could look at other people who reflected the behavior that I was, I was giving and they were um, unkind and very competent. And I didn't respect those people the same way that I respected the people who were, were kind and competent. Those are such awesome insights. It's really wonderful that you were able to see that and to grow from it. I felt really lucky. The practice that, that we worked at um, really valued you growing not only as a, as a technician or a doctor or whatever, you were, whatever skill set you were hired in for. They wanted to see you not just grow that way, but personally and professionally. Um, and so they actually, when I went, went in and said, hey, you know, I don't have great reviews in this area. This is something that I like to look, look at doing. Um, the Kaiser courses are this much. Um, they were like, yep, we will pay for that because that is, you will, you will benefit from this and we will benefit from your growth. Um, so I loved, I loved that aspect of being there um, and getting to, getting to, to grow and have someone, um, an employer be really supportive of that that personal and professional growth. And they were right. Like I was a completely different person when I left that practice um, to, to go purely into administrative work than I was when I walked in as a graveyard technician. Yeah. And it's such a benefit to the practice as well. You know, that it's a really worthwhile investment in anything that you can do that helps make the individuals on your team better and stronger. Um, that that they're comfortable with, that they can grow from, as opposed to being told how to be, but giving them an opportunity to grow and learn and explore new new ways of being. Yeah, and it was really awesome because it felt like it was such a safe environment to say, man, I have some issues. And like, I came into this practice with these issues. um, And I know that you hired me, but you didn't hire my issues. And I'd like to work through some of this. And some of it is going to be really isn't, isn't going to be about my work. It's going to be about my, my personhood. Um, and they were like, no, you like, however we can help you be, um, show up here a hundred percent. We'd love to help. Yeah. Um, and I, I love that. And I wish that more, um, more practices could recognize that, um, the, the idea of, you should leave your problems at home um, and leave them on the other side of the work door. I mean, yes, but there's another side to that is that sometimes we don't have the skill set to do that and we need to learn it. Right. It's, it's a lovely aspirational idea, but the reality is even the effort of doing that will have some bleed through. There will, there will be effects um, even for people who are good at doing that. Yeah, for sure. So if we, we circle our way back around to organization, um, what would you suggest for somebody who's feeling very disorganized and would like to become better at it? Sure. Um, I think one of, the, one of the key things for me, and I think is really key, um, and you brought it up in the, in the introduction, is you said, where's the time for sleep? Um, and, and I joke, I do, I do have a sleep disorder. But sleep was the key for me to being able to function as as an adult human, um, was making sure I was getting adequate sleep um, and scheduling it and making that a priority. And I think that we need to look at the things that are we are currently doing uh, and map them out. So I think a lot of us feel completely overwhelmed. But if we actually mapped out the amount of time that we're spending, we would discover we have a whole lot of um, technically unused time Mm -hmm. uh, and it's really shocking. So we're all given the same amount of time in a day. Um, It doesn't change for anybody. Um, And how we're spending those hours and those minutes really makes an impact. And so that's the number one thing is, is look at where you're actually spending your time. Have you read the book? I know how she does that. I think that's the name of it. No. It's 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 a twist on the I don't know how she does it all kind of thing. And it it's a woman who did research and she did it with um 
executive mothers. So balancing Mm -hmm. um, their parenting responsibilities and their work responsibilities. And she had them tracking their hours, you know, the whole idea of we all have the same number of hours and how, and how is all that time breaking out? And there is a lot of um, waste. Having downtime is valuable. So downtime is not waste, but having time that you are just sort of like, oh, I don't have any time. I don't have any time. And you just spend it in frenetic activity where you don't really get anything done and you don't feel better on any front is common and unhealthy and unproductive. Yeah. The book that I really recommend to people, I'm going to, I just added that to my list. Um, But the book that I read that I really recommend, and it's got uh, good worksheets in it to to use, is 168 Hours, You Have More Time Than You Think, Um, and it's by Laura uh, Vanderkam. It's the same woman. Oh, okay, great. (laughs) Yes. Okay, I'm like, that's a very similar- It's book one and book two. Yes. Okay. Okay, awesome. I'll link to both of them. I absolutely love that book. And I use that when, um, and I do some consulting. And so I've had people come and say, you know, I'm really struggling. I don't have, I don't have the time to do this. And a lot of time we have to say, what are you willing to give up? Right. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a trade. So, um, and we think, oh, I can't spend this 15 minutes extra at work with this client, um, who's asking for something because I have to get out of here by five because I have to be here at this time. And it's like, well, you know, let's, let's look at the trade-off. Let's look at um, if you went into this with a different mindset and you were looking at the hours that you were spending and you knew that maybe the hour, the 15 minutes that you're spending today, you would be able to gain that back in another place. Like you actually, when you map out the time that you spend, you actually gain control over it Mm -hmm. because you realize that a lot of those are choices that you're making. And you may not have a choice as to what time you go to work and what time you're off, but you do have, um, have choices surrounding the rest of that. And it is really hard when you've got people who are parents. uh, And I recently was helping, uh, helping a friend who, uh, who has two kids and picking them up from school. And man, that is a lot and it's scheduled and you have to do this at this time and you have to be there and you have to drop this kid off at this time. And that can be, it can be a lot and it can feel like a lot is out of your control. So taking back the control where you can is, is again, coping mechanism for me. But I think it's really important for everybody to not feel so overwhelmed. Yeah. It's making intentional choices. So you may still have difficult things you need to do, but uh, being objective about them and, and choosing how and when to accomplish some of these things is really empowering and uh, so helpful. I when talk I, about that. Oh, you I, talk about, <laughs> I talk about that um, a lot when I talk about mental health and people are talking about how they love the veterinary field, but they're so tapped out in it and they're just mm-hmm. done. And um, the advice that I can give in this area Um, is a little counterintuitive, but once you think about it, you're like, oh, that makes sense. I asked them when the last time they volunteered for a veterinary Mm -hmm. event was, and they're like, I don't have the time. And I'm like, no, 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 you choose. So you go do a spay neuter clinic in your community. You go to a, you go help with a shot clinic. You go help for disaster relief, like any of these things. And they're your choice. You choose how you're spending the time. And you can really reinvigorate yourself. So I did um, 15 years of uh, teaching uh, obedience in the community that I was working in. And then I continued to do disaster preparedness and disaster relief work uh, with the California Veterinary Medical Relief Corps. I did uh, worked with our local unhoused population and their pets and man, just being in those different environments really reinvigorates you for the day-to-day general practice or emergency practice or specialty, whatever it is that you're doing, it can really reignite that because you're making the choice to do that. And you just get to fill your bucket and go back, go back to work with, uh, with a lot more resources. 
Yeah, there's a lot of research on volunteering and how beneficial it is. And it's really interesting because when you are depleted, you feel like I don't have time for any of that. Um, and yet it fills you back up. I volunteer at a, at a, uh, a shelter for people who are experiencing, who have experienced domestic violence, sexual assault, or, or any sort of homelessness issues. And I had a terrible day one day last week when my dog had been very, very ill. Like we were, we were making decisions kind of ill. Everything Aww. is good now, but good. it was a really bad day. And I thought, I'm not, I'm not going tonight. I'm just going to call them and tell them I can't come tonight. But my dog was stable at that point. And so I was like, you're not going for you at this point. It's not that you need to be here for the dog. And so I went, I was like, you have to go. Well, my job is to play with children. <laughs> and so I spent an hour and a half with two-year-olds watching them climb up and jump off of a foam square. And it was awesome. It was absolutely the best possible thing I could have done. And that when I came home, I was able to see my dog was okay, but I was better. I had more bandwidth for dealing with just the stress of what was going on um, because I had done something for someone else and gotten out of my own head and had a different experience. So I think volunteering is that counterintuitive piece that when we're stressed, we're like, no, 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 I cannot. I don't, I can't do that. That's too much. And yet it, it fills us up in a way nothing else does. Yeah, it's, it's so important. And it can be, I think that people think about it and they're like, oh, it's this huge time commitment. It's this thing. And it doesn't have to be. I recently took on, um, I just moved to Greenville, South Carolina and um, moved into this really cute community called Brunton Town. It's a really old community. And I happen to live in like the one strip of brand, uh, almost brand new houses. They're less than, uh, less than eight years old. Um, and I went to the community meeting and they were looking for someone to head up the, uh, tree planting in the community. And I was like, Oh, I can do that. That's, you know, so I went door to door on the like 24 houses in my cul-de-sac and handed out, uh, tree information and talked to them about gardening. Mm -hmm. um, made a friend with a, a very nice elderly woman down the down the street and met the woman across the street whose family's lived in this community for 150 years. Wow. Yeah. And it's like, it doesn't, it, it like all I did was hand out some papers and then be available to answer the phone occasionally and pick up a piece of paper and and send that piece of paper to someone else. That's it. That's all I had to do. And, um, and I've certainly made at least one new friend out of mm -hmm. it and, uh, made her day cause she's super excited that she gets new trees. So there's that. And I have a retired racing greyhound and I work with, uh, I worked with the community in California when I was there and here I immediately jumped into the greyhound community and, uh, went to a home show and got to talk to a bunch of people uh, about retired racers. Um, and it was really fun. And just being able to like watch little kids who their parents are like, I can't believe you walked up to your dog. He's terrified of animals. <laughs> and I'm like, there's just something special about this dog's soul. Like yeah. he just speaks to, there to are people. Some. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, it's really important that we be able to, to find the things, uh, the areas that we can give back. And I think that's a tough one for a lot of people. And I know for me, when I first went into getting help, getting therapy, um, I would not have been able to tell you there was anything that I had to give. Um, and I was already volunteering mm -hmm. at that point, but it didn't, I didn't realize I had something. Uh, there were things about me that, that I could give back. And, uh, I think yeah. it's, it's a hard, hard discussion point for a lot of people is to say, what is it about me that, that I can, I can do? What about me is special? Um, mm -hmm. what are my interests that are special? Um, uh, but they've definitely, they've, everybody's got them. Everybody has them, but they're so familiar to the individual that they feel like nothing special. Like oh, anyone can do that. You know, like your yep. organizational skills there. I'm sure there was a time in your life when people were like, wow, how did you do that? And you were like, it's simple. Yeah. Well, 
Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and I still, to this day, I'm like, I'm sorry, I, I don't, I don't understand. Like, they'll be like, how did you do that? And I'm like, well, I started, let's start there. I did the thing. <laughs> oh, that's um, the hard part. <laughs> it is the hard part. And, and I definitely, I do have those struggles. There are times when I'm like, man, I really don't want to do that thing. And it's like you deciding that you were going to go play with those kids, mm -hmm. you know, you, um, and I struggle. I, I am not the person who gets up and exercises. I don't do it. And I know I would feel better if I did it. And so I still fight those battles. We so, all do. I mean, that's the yeah. thing with, with resilience is there's no, there's no finish line gold medal. Like, Oh, look, you've done life perfectly. Yay. You <laughs> um, it's for everyone. There will be things that are, are easier for us to adapt to and things that we have to work toward. Um, but the more, the more it can be done with the attitude of curiosity and exploration, I think the easier it is for people to succeed. And being able to look back at my life and say, look at how far I've come. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's just it is that I think if we can look at how far we've come, like yeah. we can make a tiny change in our life and it makes a huge impact and we can just, uh, celebrate those moments and be proud of, be proud of those things. And that, that would make a big impact on a lot of us as well. Yeah, that's really beautiful. And I think it's a really good spot to wrap up here because I think that that's profound. So thank you for that, Jamie. If people wanted to learn more about you and the things that you're interested and involved in, how could they do that? Sure, absolutely. So I don't have a big social media presence. That's one of uh, one of my boundaries. Facebook is kind of just like all garden groups uh, at this point in my life. Um, but you can find out about Dr. Andy Rourke at drandyrourke.com and unchartedvet.com is the conference and community that I am involved with. And then I'd invite you all, for those of you who are looking for uh, education, you can go to recoverinitiative.org and look into evidence-based CPR and veterinary medicine. And I'll tell you what, that course doesn't just teach you about CPR. It teaches you about team communication. And I think that's the most important takeaway um, from, from that course uh, mm -hmm. is is that you can communicate better as a team and that it's a skill we can all learn. Yes, that's and well worth developing. It's a very good one. Well, thank you so much, Jamie. I really appreciate you talking with me today. Thank you for having me. I had a lot of fun. I really appreciate it.